The gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. Dennis White, thank you so much for having me back up to MIT. Yeah. Great to have you here. Um, you know, last time that we spoke, you gave me my original 101 on fusion. And we're going to get to that in this conversation as well. But sure. before we do, something I didn't get to learn about you was your backstory and your history. And I'd love to explore that a little bit. Yeah. So um, so I grew up, uh, if you've ever been to the middle of nowhere, <laughs> take a drive for another hour. And that's, that's kind of where I grew up. It was actually, it's a remote um, location in Canada. Wow. In Saskatchewan, uh, rural. Uh, my, you know, my family were all fa farmers. Um, uh, but I just like I loved science and math, and I, I was just like the the biggest nerd you can imagine. You know, um, I think I read every science fiction book in my school's library, you know, about like three times. Starting the time with I, Dune. I uh, <laughs> actually, that wasn't in there. That was probably too controversial for there. Um, uh, you know, by the time I was like in fifth or sixth grade, uh, yeah. you know, um, and I just always knew, you know, that I really wanted to be a, a scientist yeah. and, and to do that exploration. Um, and, and then it was an interesting path there. You know, I had uh, fantastic opportunities in schools in, in Canada, um, you know, and uh, I really, it was, I have to give credit to like one meeting almost like set yeah. my, set the course for me was that I went to school, I was, all, I was really interested in fusion, um, you know, early on and I read uh, papers, uh, you know, sort of popular science papers on it. Um, I did my... I think my 11th grade physics term paper was on fusion. What did you write about? Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm trying to find it. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> but I think it was, you know, it was just the promise of it as an, as an energy source and like what it meant. I do remember getting back the paper from my physics teacher and he said, um, oh, this is a great job, but it's too complicated. <laughs> he still gave me an A though. <laughs> um, and then uh, I went through engineering and physics at the University of Saskatchewan, and uh, by chance, they happened to have a small plasma, you know, plasma program there. It wasn't really oriented around fusion, um, but what is, what is a plasma program in the middle of Saskatchewan? Yeah, well, like? actually, it's, 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 it's actually most of it was around um, atmospheric plasmas. Ah. So um, when you're that far north, you know, studying northern lights, aurora borealis, these are plasmas actually. So. There was a pretty substantial research program that was there in that um, there was a, a really small seeded fusion program mm -hmm. as well there too. Um, and then it just turned out that, you know, I walked into my professor's uh, office, uh, Harvey Skarsgård, and uh, said, I'm really enjoying the class. This is my se last semester of my senior year. You know, is there, and I already had a job offer to go work for Schlumberger out in the oil field doing nuclear logging, actually, which is an interesting <laughs> um, you know, connection back to where I ended up uh, coming back into 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 nuclear department, um, and I just walked into his into his uh, office and said, you know, well, is there a way I could be like in graduate school? Um, and because I, I hadn't really considered the, that, you know, seriously, he goes, oh, he goes, yeah, I just got like a letter from my colleague. Um, they started up the fusion lab just outside of Montreal. And they're looking for students. Would you be interested? Wow. And I just said, yeah. Good timing. And uh, I had an offer letter two weeks later. I had sent, I, he sent in my CV. Obviously, he recommended me um, to the person who was the lab director and ended up being my PhD supervisor. 
Um, and I just looked at that and they said, okay, well, let's go give it a shot. Yeah. Like live in Montreal. Um, I'd never lived in a big city before. So it's just like, go, go to Montreal, learn, learn French and sort of immerse yourself in the culture and get to work on a tokamak, which was... <laughs> they had uh, a tokamak and they in had, Montreal. They ab absolutely had a tokamak. Very interesting. That another... No, so, uh, no. so, so uh, we have to explain a little bit. A tokamak is yeah. like a donut-shaped fusion. Yeah, it, it's a weirdly sounding name. It's actually literally a, a Russian acronym, um, which, it, it, but is basically you know toroidal, which means donut-shaped, donut-shaped um, chamber with with magnets. Cool, basically. What I mean. So this is um, um, you know one of the, probably the most popular devices to, to build to study fusion and to make fusion happen. happen. Um, and uh, it was actually, that, that was, was an interesting um, uh, program because it was hosted at an industrial laboratory. It was hosted at uh, the Hydro-Quebec, Hydro-Quebec in French, Hydro-Quebec Research Facility in suburban, um, in the suburbs of Montreal. And uh, again, it was interesting of these things coming back around, you know, in the end that, you know, as you know, and you're going to be talking with my colleague, Bob Mumgard, yeah. as the CEO, is that, you know, turning back in a sense, coming back around into more industrial development of fusion is really, is really interesting. So, so yeah. Hydro, hydro uh, the, what was that company, Hydro? Hydro Quebec. Hydro it's, Quebec, that, it's, that's a utility. It's that's a utility. not a government agency. That's it, an industry it, saying we're going to It, it is an industry, yeah. I mean, in, in, in Canada, they're called Crown Corporate. I mean, it's partially owned or somewhat owned by the government, but it is it is a utility. It's a like company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is a utility. And so by the fact that they essentially had a partnership with the federal government about sponsoring fusion, yeah. Because they were looking at this and just like, oh, well, both they could host it because they have a huge research facility that was there. Um, obviously, the other you know, aspects of electrical engineering and power supplies, they, they had that, that, that expertise, but also with the long-term goal. It's like, mm -hmm. can this actually be you know, something that we will use to generate electricity? So what do you do on that tokamak? Yeah, so I learned about fusion, you know. Um, takes, it's, so... Um, Fusion is, so it's usually the, 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 the field or the discipline most associated with is plasma physics because in fusion, like what does a tokamak do? It basically makes and contains a plasma. And what is a plasma? A plasma is, uh, is anything, it's actually a phase of matter. Yeah, so, like solid or yeah, liquid exactly, or gas, yeah, exactly. But... Solid, you heat that up, it becomes a liquid. You heat that up, it becomes a gas. So it turns out if you heat gases past sort of around five, to 10,000 degrees, they become a plasma. Um, and so most of the matter in the universe is actually in the plasma state. On Earth though, because everything is at near room temperature, er, er, basically everything is the, the other three phases of matter. So, but, and the reason for that is because stars, yeah. where the, the coldest part like of our, of our sun, yeah. is like, like the, the part that we see when we look up in the sky, is about 5,000 degrees. Uh, it surfaces in, in basically in the plasma state, and the uh, the rest of it is clearly in the plasma state because it's even hotter in the center of the sun. You know, is about 15 million degrees, um, uh, and that's actually where fusion occurs because it things have to be hot to make fusion. And 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 that's because hot actually is fast, right? Yeah. Hot is things moving fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and that's a prerequisite for fusion. It's the prerequisite for fusion because unlike fission. I mean, it's literally the opposite re reaction uh, of it. So fission, uh, which is what nuclear power plants are based on um, t today, uh, takes the biggest, basically almost the, one of the most unstable kinds of atoms, uranium, um, and basically tickles this with an, an, a free neutron. Boom, it's, it fissions or splits apart, and it releases large amounts of energy. You start, then you capture that energy. Fusion, so that can happen at room temperature because... Yeah. The, the, in fact, it does happen at room temperature because the neutron has to be around room temperature for that to happen effectively. The uh, a fusion happens that you you take uh, you're taking the lightest nuclei, hydrogen, um, and the, its isotopes, and you're trying to get them to form helium. Uh, this means that you have to get the nuclei, not the atoms, the nuclei, like basically to touch each other. They're almost internuclear distances. But, but, but they don't want to. They don't want to because they're, they're positive magnets. Exactly. They're both have positive charge. 
you know, like charges repel. Yeah. So as they approach one another, the Coulomb force, the electrostatic force, yeah. is pushing them apart. So you just do a quick, you know, estimate of this and you look at it and you go, oh, well, like how energetic do they need to be to get close enough to touch? Yeah. And it's and it's it's a funny unit, but it's but it's you know it's a few hundred kilo electron volts. Okay. What does that mean? It means that if if I was to take a uh, a, a like basically take a a, a proton or hydrogen yeah. or an isotope of it, I, I have to excel and because it has a single char it has the charge of an electron. Uh, then I have to basically accelerate this in a field which is several hundred thousand volts, um, and then r slam into the into the target, and that can make fusion happen. Uh, that's an accelerator. Yeah. Okay, so th this is a key part though to, to, to fusion. So we make fusion happen all the time. In fact, that was um, you know the the basically back in the 1930s, the constructions of the first uh, modern accelerators allowed. Uh, us to basically start triggering those reactions. It's the re, you know we use we then use that as a tool for scientific exploration to basically understand like how do nuclei combine you know all the different all its different combinations, but you can't make energy from that. It turns out so you can make fusion really simple, but and the reason for it is because the probability of the fusion occurring is really small. Why? Um, because uh, actually it goes back to that. Same reason because it's got because it is a, a it's a charged particle. It actually feels the Coulomb force of all the other things. So if you just take a target of regular matter mm -hmm. and you take this sort of hundred you, you accelerate it through hundred thousand volts and you slam it into a target, it will produce fusion. But only about like one in ten thousand of them or something like that. Where do the rest go? They actually just get they actually or they stay there. And what happens? They just give up their energy by charged particle collisions, which are just and, kinetic energy, just friction. Yeah, and, and it's it's so called Coulomb collision, which just means, and they're really effective at slowing down charged particles because it doesn't. It, that is a force that they don't have to touch. It just has to feel the, the the electric field produced by the other charged particles. And of course, matter is made up of basically right. all that, particularly the electrons. I so mean, I feel like that's yeah, what is happening, yeah. even like. When I touch my two hands, they're not yeah. really touching. They're that's just right. kind of an electrostatic force exactly. at a really small distance. It, it, that, 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 that is exactly the reason your fingers don't go together. So, um, so this is why fusion has to be not just energetic, which is yeah. true. It has to be hot. Mm. Everything has to be hot. Like you can't, you can't make fusion work at room temperature, because when you give that, you you make fusion reactions, but it always uses more power. Or, or energy than so, it takes to actually make the then recover from the fusion. So everything has to be hot. Everything. Let me make sure I understand that. Yep. That's because if you have two particles that don't hit each other with enough force, they're not yeah. hot enough. They're yeah. not fast enough. Yeah. Then they're just going to dissipate that energy exactly. and not actually combine fuse yep. together. Exactly. Exactly. So in the end, you have to contain this thing and get it hot. So because right. every particle has very high average kinetic energy. So how, how high? So to make fusion work in stars, again, it has to be about 15, 20 million degrees wow. in the center of a star. That's hot enough that it actually, you know, that basically the, the particles exchange their kinetic energy, but you don't care because everything's hot. And, and here's a weird thing, though, and if there's not on Earth, by the way, it, it's about 100 million degrees. 100 to make, million. About to make fusion. Why so much hotter? It's because we actually use a very different kind of fusion process than stars use. Um, and the other part of it is that stars are extraordinarily good containers of the energy that they're using. So, right, because you don't yeah. have to worry about anything else. You just got a nice little vacuum around you, you got the and perfect a lot of vacuum. mass pulling yeah. everything together. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically an enormous gravitational container. Um, and when a fusion reaction occurs in the center of the sun, it releases energy. Yeah. Huge, large amounts of energy. Um, like, how, wh where does that energy go? Well, eventually, it leaves as light yeah. at the surface photons. of the sun. Yeah, photons, right? Uh, that's what, and that's why we exist. You know, it's yeah. that energy. Is, is by the way, literally like the the interesting atoms in you was made by this process. 
because it was, it was made in, in in basically in the that's explosion what they call of stellar the, nucleosynthesis. It, it, exactly. That's where because the, the the universe more or less started with boring hydrogen and a little bit of helium and, and deuterium. And what stars have done is basically make all of the rest of the um, of of the elements. Um, including, as I said, the sort of the, the more interesting ones that are in us are in that. So we're, we're literally born out of stars. But, and, uh, and fusion is the source of, be, of almost all energy, actually, beca but because of that. Yeah. What's the difference in what we're trying to recreate here? You said it's a different type of fusion. What are we trying to do here? Yeah, so, um, so, so we, we, so we, actually, it's interesting. Stars actually don't make a lot of power for how big they are. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, it's it's about a volume average. Is that ever? It's about one of our star. It's about like about a one watt in every is made for every cubic meter. So yeah, that's not much that's at all. That's teeny. Like you think about it, like what a, what a watt one watt light bulb or battery. It's like it's like not. It's just that it's huge. Right. <laughs> it's, it's got a lot of cubic meters, right? That it does it. So and so that's an, a, one interesting difference is that on Earth. We basically are shooting for many millions of watts per cubic meter. Because if you don't get to that, uh, it's probably going to be hard to make it economic, look economically attractive because that volume, you know, you, you, you pay the price for that volume. You have to build, you have to build a container around it, right? Um, and that is, uh, and this is actually where, you know, we do share this, by the way, which is interesting with fission. And it's about why... You pursue, of course, we have fission and nuclear power plants now. Why are we going after fusion? It's because it's the other power source that gives you many, ten, you know, it can be up to many tens of millions of watts per cubic meter. Um, and that kind of power, what we would call power density, is what is actually the, uh, in the end, like the most attractive part of using. That's what drives energy. the so cost of the overall system. It drives the cost, but it's also about how you can deploy it. You know, so the relative environmental footprint of, of just in, in mani namely here meaning like how much space you need to build something, um, you know, just gets reduced. So, um, you know, and this becomes in the end, uh, you know, a challenge of low power density ones like renewables is that it's like, well, you have to put them somewhere because right. they, they're, they're not generating a lot of power in a relative way, you know, and, compared to... And you got to dig up a lot of stuff even to make them. It takes energy to make energy when it's not power dense. And then, then it's not power dense. So that's actually why we go after we, we go after fusion. And the other part is that we actually use a... Uh, um, I mean, we, we, we create something that is like the, the, the center of SARS, uh, like I said, about 100 million degrees. Um, and... You, we also use a special, basically high octane fuel hmm. to do this. Is actually to, to recreate this. So we use deuterium uh, is the fuel that we use, and the other fuel is lithium uh, here on Earth. Uh, the f thing that actually fuses is deuterium and tritium, but we actually just make the tritium internally, self consistently internally. Yeah. I want to get to that. Actually, yeah. that's a point that I really want to explore. Sure. Uh, how you get tritium out of lithium? But before we get too far ahead yeah. of ourselves. Uh, we haven't even got you to the United States yet. You're still yeah. in Canada, according oh, to Oh, yeah, story. yeah, yeah. So did my PhD, I mean, within a week of being in a research lab, it was just like, oh, my God, this is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I knew this is what I was going to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was no question about that. Um, I had the exact opposite ex experience. I, um, I worked at a condensed matter physics lab at Berkeley in undergrad, and... I was there for one summer, and I said, "Get me out of here! I never want to be yeah. in a lab again." <laughs> it is. It, it's interesting, just about like. Well, anyway, that's what I tell my daughters too: is go try different things because you're never yeah. really quite sure about what you're actually going to like. Um, uh, yep. So I did that. Got my PhD. Um, uh, I got a uh, one. I got this one of these uh, a national grant from the Canadian uh, government as a postdoc that basically it'll just more or less allowed you to go anywhere. In fact, they encouraged you to go outside of Canada in this to sort of gain experience. Yeah. Uh, I went down to San Diego uh, at a, and a company called General Atomics and an, an experiment called D3D, which is on the Tokamak. Um, so th that was great, and I was loving it there as well too. And then unfortunately they canceled the Canadian fusion program. So it was always my plan, actually, to go back to, to Canada. But you were stranded. Stranded, stranded in the U.S. Stranded in the U.S. 
Um, so, um, yeah, I've, so I've lived here now for uh, 25 years in the United States. And um, in the end, it gave me the opportunity. It was a, um, it was a fr frustration. My wife is Canadian. My, my entire family lives in Canada. Um, and, but I was not, a, I was basically, you know, frozen out from being able to do, pursue fusion research there, really. But we are pretty lucky to have you. You rose through the ranks here. I mean, now you're yeah. the head of... Yeah. The nuclear department at MIT and the head of the the, the, the plasma research yeah, center here. Yeah, as well. yeah, yeah. How, but, how did that happen? How, how, did that happen? How, how did that happen? Yeah, so I, I was there for a while and I decided, you know, re relatively late compared to most people that I I wanted to give academia a shot. Like I was I was a research scientist. I, w I had a very successful program that was going on, and there were a variety of things that. Um, that, that, that sort of pushed that. Um, I, I think it was really in the end, it was interesting. I think the, probably the primary vote motivator for me was um, I really wanted to have like the intellectual freedom that comes of being uh, an academic uh, and being able to pursue my own sort of ideas uh, in a way that usually just isn't possible in a more structured system as a research scientist. Um, it wasn't, it was interesting because it wasn't so much motivated about, about having students. I thought I would probably would enjoy teaching. Um, that part surprised me, actually. It was how much I loved teaching then in the end. And it was like, this became, so that first part was true uh, about being an academic, but the second part of the enjoyment and then, and then how much better of a researcher it made me by becoming a teacher. How so? Oh, I, I think one of the first things was, um, you know, basically being able to describe to your student like why something is at, the fun, at a fundamental level. Uh, many times that exercise led to ideas that actually yeah. turned into big projects. It's yeah. like sort of like one of them, like explaining what I was just say, saying about like accelerators yeah. and things. That actually directly led to basically to the project, you know, that got me tenure <laughs> because I was explaining it. And then I was just like, oh, what if we did this and that? And we did that, this and that, and it was sort of a new idea and, um, and it worked. So I've just, I've really loved that part. So I was... It's kind of like yeah. a socially acceptable way to think out loud, yeah. essentially. Yeah. It's teaching someone something. Ex exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and then, of course, uh, also I, I was at University of Wisconsin. In fact, I just, was, I just gave the cloak in there on, on Friday. Um, What's a cloak? Uh, just basically, a, it's a fancy word for a seminar. That, but you're giving it to the academic department. So I was giving them, um, it's supposed to be a little bit more, you know, pedagogical than a, just a, a standard seminar. Um, and uh, so I was there for four years. Uh, I really liked the freedom of being my, have being a faculty member. But, um, and Wisconsin has a great fusion and plasma program. But I kind of missed being in a bigger team. Mm. Um, and also, my research was, uh, had some focal areas, but I wasn't really, it was, you know, sort of more fundamental work, which is which is also fine. I kind of missed like the applied part. Um, so, uh, what really attracted me? I mean, people are, are surprised at this. It wasn't really that it was MIT that actually brought got me here. It was the fact that the Plaza Science and Fusion Center, which now of which I'm the director, uh, is here, um, and because they had the biggest university research lab by quite a bit actually in the United States, they ran a tokamak, which I really wanted to be back in the fold of that. Yet I was able to do the teaching and the sort of have the freedom of my own laboratory as well too. It was like okay, this I and, you know it probably doesn't hurt that it was MIT either. <laughs> um, and uh, in I came. That was twelve years ago, and. Uh, uh, then I've been, you know, very much, um, you know, blessed with being given uh, the, the leadership uh, roles that I have. What What did the program look like? What did the plasma program look like when you first got here versus what it is today? Yeah, so it's always evolved a lot. Um, in some in some ways, though, there's still some commonalities in this. So the approach or the the uh, the specialty of MIT's fusion program has always been built around magnet technology mm. um, and in particular oh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, this this is right back in the very uh, very beginnings in fact of, of the fusion laboratory were in the ma ma magnet lab the, the bitter Francis bitter magnet lab uh, which they're co-located uh, and uh, 
Um, and so there was a realization by a set of uh, different people, uh, and I think through, you know, Bruno Coppi is, is one who is a, 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 a professor in the physics department, um, uh, Benjamin Lax, uh, um, uh, other, who was at the Magnet Lab, um, uh, Bruce Montgomery, who was sort of one of these brilliant mag magnet engineers. Uh, back in the 70s, they would kind of put together this idea. It's like, oh, yeah, well, remember I said you have to contain plasmas, right? So we use magnetic containers. Um, but they had a, the ability to make magnetic fields, which were just much stronger than other laboratories were considering because of that expertise. And so they said, oh, well, that would be a good thing because we can basically, by some pretty basic arguments, you know, make the device smaller. And then, in fact, that's what they did. And that's the Alcator program. There, and when I came to, to MIT, Alcator CMOD was the third incarnation of those. Of those, Alcator is literally an Italian acronym for high field torus, and we love our acronyms in fusion. Um, and uh, so it was being operated here. It was a team of you know over a hundred you know people, um, like something like you know thirty graduate students on, on the program, uh, uh, both a domestic and international user facility. Um, you know, so like a premier, you know, world class fusion program, but located in the heart of MIT. Yeah. Um, so obviously, the you know, an education uh, and training mission, which was you know, first rate as well too. So that's that that was the focus of the program. Um, so that actually stopped operating uh, a couple of years ago, hmm. um, and that was f solely funded through the Department of Energy. Um, and uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, the basically, US, the United States Department, the of United Energy. States Department of Energy, yeah. and uh, so they announced, though, um, uh, about when was that, 2012, I guess, they basically announced their intention to like not keep funding the project anymore, um, and they were going to, you know, move on to to other things, and they were not going to replace the experiment at MIT either. Why? Um, well, let me ask. Actually, let me ask you a different one. I can tell you what the, the public statement was that we were, we were, we were too small, yeah. which, by the way, there will be some irony when we come back to <laughs> what, 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 in that when the story comes around. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 complicated, um, and in some sense, you know, you don't want to just keep operating the same device in perpetuity. Like, uh, you know, at, at some point. You should evolve the program. I mean, I don't think I agreed with them at that with, with how they were evolving the program, but you know that was that was their decision. So, what what facilities here now? What what fusion takes place here now? So uh, again, so we stopped. Uh, although very successful, we, we we had a particularly successful last uh, sort of run with it, uh, really focusing on squeezing out the physics of the performance of the device at high magnetic fields. Yeah. We actually on the last day of its operations, we actually set a world record for a fusion <laughs> performance, um, yeah, which was which was pretty which was pretty good. Um, go out with yeah, a bang. Go out with a bang. Yeah, no, actually the machine the the, the device performed wonderfully, and we actually surpassed uh, two atmospheres of pressure in a in a plasma that was significantly hotter than the center of the sun, and nobody had ever actually gotten past two atmospheres before as a huge deal, yeah, actually. Why is that significant? Why, what yeah. does an atmosphere have to do with anything? So remember I told you everything has to be hot, yeah. uh, but it also has to be dense enough that you basically you're going to make enough you know, fusion reactions, both to keep itself hot and to make a lot of net power. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that the um, uh, w w when we make fusion work, actually the amount of power you get per unit volume, yeah. power density, goes like the pressure of the plasma squared. Um, so by the fact that we're, you know, we, we basically had approximately double the plasma pressure of any other device, yeah. that means like we're quadruple the amount of power density per, per unit volume. What's, and that's a key economic driver in the course, end for, for, for so fusion. So what's, um, what's stopping another doubling of pressure? What are the fundamental limits that, what, what makes it hard when you try to go higher to, higher pressure? Yeah, so the, the it, it's sort of like, you can think of it like a balloon, right? Like if you try to overinflate a balloon, like the, it'll break, yeah. right? Um, it, it, it's, it, that's a pretty good analogy to what happens to the magnetic field. Like the device itself doesn't, doesn't break, yeah. I mean, the physical objects. But the interior part of this can get so much pressure that it will 
basically try to break the magnetic bottle. Um, so this, this is, we actually have a parameter that is probably the, one of the most famous of the plasma physics parameters called beta, which is the ratio of the pressure of the plasma compared to the external pressure which is being applied by the magnetic field. Because that's actually what magnetic fields are doing is that they're exerting a magnetostatic pressure that is essentially counteracting or containing the plasma. Is there, you know, when I think of pressure, I think, okay, I'm going to hold my fist with this, you know, hand, I squeeze, does it squeeze back? Does it push back mm -hmm. against the magnet itself? That's exactly what's happening, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, and, 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 so you've got and, materials and, challenges there too, then. Ah, right? well, the material challenge for the hot part of the fusion is that there can't be any materials. There are no right. materials around because... You need to create um, your own little vacuum. So we create our, we basically trick the plasma into not knowing it's on Earth, is what I say. Um, so we create a very, we create a vacuum that is like outer space. There's no air, there's no nothing else. Inside the it. donut. Inside the donut. Um, and we evacuate all the air and then we turn on, and then we turn on the magnetic field and then we basically insert plasma in this. And because the magnetic field is pushing with a force, but it's not physically, con the, the coils don't actually physically connect, and nothing contacts the plasma where it's hot because if you put anything like a physical object nearby, it actually, I mean, most people just go, oh, you would melt something because it's so hot. It's actually the opposite. What happens is the plasma just gets really cold. Um, so this is like why, um, um, and we're, I'm looking up right now because there's fluorescent light bulbs here. Yeah. That's a plasma inside of that. That's a plasma. That's a plasma. But that is like really cold. Like obviously the, the, the bulb is not melting, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like why, why is that? It's actually it's because the plasma is not contained in that. It's actually, it's, it, it, is, it is going out and hitting the glass wall of what's around it. And for that reason, it stays, it stays really cold. Really cold meaning like only like five, 5,000 degrees or something like that. Um, and there's very, very few particles of it. So that's why the bulb doesn't, doesn't get hot. So in the end, that's the, uh, the, the thing that we're doing is holding the plasma away from any physical object. Like, so the interior of that, it really doesn't know it's on Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, this is in the end why, by, by this, so because when people you know, hear this, they just go, 100 million degrees. You know, is that is that is that something I should be scared of? Yeah. It's actually no. Uh, the reason for this is because remember I said it's really hot, but it's only got a few atmospheres of pressure. So this means that when we when we have this object that's making this this extraordinary amount of of power from yeah. fusion, it actually has almost no energy associated with it. <laughs> which which sounds and, and, and uh, for example the. You know the uh, the object that we talk about called Arc, which is um, which uh, is essentially like a prototype commercial, uh, is that the entirety of the plasma when it's sitting there making many hundred millions of watts of fusion power has the energy content of a big pot of boiling water. Because when we talk about one hundred million degrees, what we're really talking about is speed, yeah, more than more than thermal mass, which yeah. might be like a hot rock, uh, which if exactly. you were to pick a hot rock up off a stove, yeah. my God, that would hurt yeah. for a while. Yeah. But if, if there's not much if there's not much mass in it, that's right. it's just a lot of fast things running it's around. It's a lot of fast things, and the, but there's very few of them. So, but we still describe it in terms of temperature. But you still describe it, because it is a temperature. So, yeah, so for instance, that record plasma that we, we, we obtained, um, you know, it's of, of course, uh, you know, a million times hotter than, yeah. than like air that, that we're breathing. But at the same time, it's like 100,000 times less dense than the air in this room. Yeah. Um, so this is why, it's, and you, those basically cancel out, and it becomes a few atmospheres of pressure. But if, we, if, uh, if it's only a hot boiling pot of water, how do we get, how do we get a, a power plant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound like that should be feasible, right? So it's actually, it's about where the power um, ends up that you make from fusion. So the power actually is in, so when the fusion occurs, um, it, it makes, it, it, what it's doing is converting hydrogen to helium. This is, this is how stars work. And, you know, eventually they, they exhaust their fuel, so the, but that takes billions of years. Um, so are two positive magnets, they slam into each other and they combine positive, and now they're- Positive ions, they get close enough, they fuse, and then 
um, even though it, it, they're, they're really energetic, like it's 100 million degrees, it's like, then the amount of energy that's released in the fusion is about a thousand times like that energy. Where so, does that come from? Yeah, well, it comes it comes from the rearrangement of of the nucleons of the of the of the uh, protons and neutrons. So, what are nucleons coming in in, in this equation when we have yeah. our two? What, yeah, so so in? we make so we use deuterium and tritium. So that is a, a deuteron is um, a proton and a neutron, and uh, a triton is a a proton and two neutrons. So basically what's involved are two protons, three um, uh, three neutrons. The helium is made of two protons, two neutrons. Um, it is an extremely, extremely stable, non-radioactive right. um, uh, uh, element. Um, and it's actually- We know helium, we yeah, make it in the balloon. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so what happens when you when you when you can get the fusion to occur? Basically, those two deuterons and two neutrons uh, make that he helium, and that's actually um, through. And, and you're releasing energy by E equals mc squared. You're actually converting mass into kinetic energy because, and the reason for this is because of that particular property of of helium uh, as an both an atom and as a nucleus. It's extremely stable. So. Um, when that fusion occurs, it releases a net energy, and and this at its heart is basically why stars work as well, well too. Now, what is it releasing physically? What shoots out? Yeah. So what comes out? So if you remember, uh, what comes out is an energetic helium, and if you, do, you did your math, sums right, you re re recognize that there was one extra neutron yeah. left over. So uh, it actually produces a, a helium and it produces a neutron. And when you, you, you specifically call that an energetic helium. Mm -hmm. uh, is that important to the energy that we, to how we create power out of the yeah. system as well? It's critical. So, um, so let's start with the helium. So, I mean, again, this is why we, we go after fusion, by the way, because you can get the fuels from everywhere. And in the fuel cycle itself, it's just like you're producing helium. That's like the ash, <laughs> yeah. right? Which again um, is just fundamentally different than what happens in, in ash, nuclear. Ash, you mean like a byproduct? Ex exactly. Right, so you put I some mean, fuel in. There's a, yeah. there's a byproduct that comes out. That byproduct is helium. Yeah, Same thing yeah. in balloons. And like a power plant that would run Cambridge and Boston would produce heal. It would produce you know a, a, a hundred pounds of helium a year. I mean, it's just like, what? <laughs> like, you really don't care about this. You literally can just let it go into the atmosphere. But what about that other neutron? Yeah, Cause exactly. Because if, exactly. if I recall, there's four types of radiation. Alpha, beta, gamma, neutron is your fourth uh -huh, type, yeah, right? Yeah. And it's also the type that creates the alpha, beta, gamma. So we've got, yeah. a little, we've got some radiation. Yeah, there. well, well, but actually, alpha is interesting. That is a helium, by the way. Right. That's, an, that, that, that's an energetic helium. So we actually, well, let me see there. So that's a really important one because remember I told you we have, we're using a magnetic co uh, container. Um, that magnetic container works on particles that have a charge, have electric charge. Mm. So the helium, the alpha, has a charge. So it's contained actually in the bottle. So when that, and that, because uh, when, when, when the energy is released, like where, so where is the fusion energy? It's in the kinetic energy of, this, of these two particles. Uh, one fifth of it is in the, the the helium, because it has more mass. It actually gets less energy. Um, so, because it, in fact, because it has four fifths of the mass, the, the total mass involved, it gets one fifth of the energy. Like if I were on a pool table and I hit yeah. a cue ball into a bowling yeah, ball, yeah, exactly. Bigger, it's, 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 it's exactly for, for that reason. So the um, that's really important because what does that do? That actually gives its energy back to the, the plasma to the other particles in it because it's much more energetic than the other particles around surrounding it. All, everything has a, a charge. It just undergoes collisions with that background and that gets it. And so in the end, in a fusion power plant, that's actually most of the power that's keeping this thing hot is yeah. the fusion power itself. And then the neutron has four fifths of the energy. No, and that's a, a feature of course of the neutron, it has no electric charge. So. So not contained by the plasma. Not, not, con not by contained, the but okay. it, it feels no force from the magnetic field. So it is literally just goes out. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so what do you do? So that neutron can give back its energy to the background environment, um, and that's actually what we do: is that we we put engineered 
thing called we call it a blanket because it's literally like it wraps around the fusion. Um, this is a terrestrial object, you know, around room temperature or somewhat higher. It's made out of you know uh, physical objects, so it can be structural materials, it can be a liquid, it can be, uh, and then basically like like by bowling ball collisions, uh, billiard ball collisions, sorry, um, it basically gives its energy back into that medium. Um, and in our particular design of ours, which we really, really like, is that we make most of that material a liquid. A liquid. A liquid. Why is it important that it's a liquid? Um, because that neutron is, uh, is very energetic. And when it in, undergoes those billiard ball collisions yeah. with the atoms that are in it, it's, it's actually causing them to be, you know, it, it really... It's sort of like a cannonball into yeah. into a thing of marbles, right? You know, um, so if those are in solid materials, that actually causes them to become disordered. Yeah, um, it breaks and apart a lattice. It, yeah, yeah, and and, and so it can lead to worse material properties. Well, it, it it worsens the material properties. So I mean, like the concrete example of that is you think about a diamond. Yeah. A diamond actually has exactly the same atoms that a piece of graphite does. Like, why is it, they're all carbon. This is like, oh, the diamond is like it is because of the ordering of the, of, of the carbon in it. Um, so neutrons disorder, yeah. they, they disorder. Um, that's why you love a liquid. Because it, it basically, it, it, the, the properties of the liquid are not dependent on the But then it can also, it. now you're giving it all this energy, yep. and now it's a liquid. Now what I'm thinking is a liquid is like a coolant. A coolant is how you get energy out of a system into a power conversion uh, apparatus where you can get electricity. Then. Exactly. Is, is that how it works? Yes. It's as simple as that. So after all this rather exotic sounding things, of, you know, hotter than the sun, yeah. and all these kind of things, um, and that's why we like our particular design as well too, um, which which uh, which goes back actually to to magnet development, is um, is that you um, it self heals, it, so right, um, it it actually produces minimal amounts of, of radiation actually, uh, because you put the right kinds, of, you basically structure the the liquid in, in a way that it's actually b bouncing around pretty benignly. Um, and in the end, you get what is almost like a perfect energy source because you end up volumetrically heating a liquid. And that liquid is then circulated around in some way to, to actually make your power. Um, and uh, you, as, an engine, as a thermal engineer, like that is the best thing possible because not having it being conducted through a surface or in some way, but just volumetric heating, a big thing, a simple thing. In the end, it looks like a great big heat source. Like what, in, in, in our particular configuration, um, it'll be a molten salt, which is actually um, uh, also very attractive because it gets hot, but it doesn't boil. Right, so, so, so this is what's used in the like the big solar plant, like Ivan Pa yep. out in the middle of the desert, yep. where you got all those mirrors and it shines sunlight, concentrates uh, into, yep. it onto a salt, and yep. then you've got a yep. something to conduct heat and move that into a power generation. And move system. that into a power generation. So same type system. Of thing. Yeah. So in the end, you know, it's all, all this really f fancy work to basically make a heat source. Yeah. But it's a bit of, I mean, it's you know, that's in the end again why fusion looks so attractive is because. You have this enormous heat source, which is basically using fuels, which are everywhere. Um, you're not producing radioactive waste in the fuel cycle itself. Okay, so yeah. now how yeah. do we, what's the strategy here? Yeah. So you got your neutron. Yeah. Neutrons, when they collide into the wrong things, yeah. uh, make them radioactive. And then that thing starts shining out its radioactivity. What do you do in this coolant specifically to make sure that when a neutron hits it, that yep. the coolant itself doesn't become radioactive. Yeah, so what you do is you basically tailor that, that salt or you pick kinds of salts that have particularly low atomic number species in them. Uh, this is for two reasons. One of them is that it is, um, uh, the, although some, some of those can become what we call activated, um, uh, you, you pick ones that actually decay very quickly so they basically relax back to not being radioactive anymore. And when it decays, it's really just giving off more heat, which exactly. means that you're and you and you you, 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 you actually just capture that that energy as well too. Um, it also is really important that it uh, does this so that it's really effective at stopping the neutron. 
This is one of the this is one of the challenges in fusion. They're very energetic neutrons, but you don't want to take up huge amounts of volume just to stop it. So ha- making them closer to the mass of the neutron, back to your billiard ball analogy, is is right. Is that um, it's good that they're light. So uh, that th- that this is this is again then where where fusion um, fundamentally differs from from, from nuclear from nuclear fission is that. Uh, they come out, we, we actually get this volumetric heating, which, which is very good. Uh, the other part is then, um, it, it, it's really, unlike in fission, where the things that it breaks up into will be radioactive just for some period of time because it's just set by nature. Um, this is actually an engineering choice. Like, what do you put in front of the neutrons, right? Um, and I haven't hit all the different constraints of, which, of what are in there, but namely... Basically, in the end, what it means is that you've got an engineering choice to put the right kinds of materials in there such that you avoid the aspects of having long-lived radioactive waste and because, because it's coming through activation, not in the fuel cycle itself. And what about that helium? I can imagine if you're constantly creating more heliums, yep. but you started off without helium, so yep. you've configured your apparatus to work without helium, yep. and then you're adding more heliums to the mix, does that somehow prevent what you want to have happen? Did the, did the heliums at, at some point get in the way of yes. the hydrogens combining? Yeah, so, so we call it the ash, which it is. So again, you know, when you, if you go back to that, the idea of thinking like having a fireplace, right? That at some point, you know, when the wood burns and it's, it's turned into ash, the ash won't burn a- anymore. So if you get too much of that, basically at some point the fire will go out. Yeah. So, okay. how do you, so how do you prevent that? So what we do is we actually have to remove the helium at some specific rate uh, from this. So the way that this works is that the, um, the helium, as I said, undergoes a, 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 through, through collisions. It basically gives back its kinetic energy. And then it comes back and it will, it will not fuse. Like helium is too stable, so it won't fuse. Uh, so this means... What you have to do is somewhere in the periphery of this, you basically put a system that removes the helium, that pumps it away. So then in the end, the ash <laughs> of, of fusion actually literally just gets pumped by like a vacuum pump. And how does the... your pump distinguish between the hydrogen that you want to keep in there and keep colliding and keep combining yeah. and the helium that you want to get rid of? It doesn't. So that's one of the, that's one of the pro- you've just identified one of the Uh-oh. severe, one of the, one of the design challenges yeah. of fusion systems is that you basically want to pump away helium and not like the unburned fuel. Yeah. Um, and helium is pretty much the hardest thing to pump in the periodic table. Why? Well, because it's a noble gas. I mean, not, so it, it is, again, it, it, it's, very, it's very attractive, the fact that we're making helium. We're gonna blow up kids' balloons, right, with our, <laughs> our the product from fusion. But it is very hard because it's not chemically active. So it is... Um, so so, so you the, can't distinguish it yeah. chemically. What about magnetically? We've got all these magnets in the system. Is there any magnetic differentiation between the hydrogen and helium? Um, that, that turns... The, 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 the problem is you're pumping it out as a neutral species. So it's actually you turn back into an atom. So what you've actually allowed it to do is basically leak out and sort of come into equilibrium with this very low density gas, which is sort of hanging on the periphery of this. We put a pump near this, and some of the some, some of this comes out. So um, very clever. I don't know if you knew the answer, if you knew this before. This is a big this is a big design challenge actually in magnetic fusion. Um, that in the end, um, when we when we actually pump it out, only about five percent or something like that of the exhaust is helium if we do a good job on it. Uh, and the rest is unburned fuel. So we actually have to take that unburned fuel and put it back, back in. in the um, yeah. Okay. So okay. are you guys working on that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Actually, it, so here, here's a good se- segue actually into this. So the, um, uh, it was actually, this was one of the topics in my fusion in design class. Um, and I think, why, why, why is this germane? Because this is about the future now and like what's going, what, what's going on here is that when I first uh, taught the class, I basically put it as a design challenge to my MIT graduate students, you know, yeah. design a pump 
that pumps helium and not and not the hydrogen. It sounds like you had a bunch of free engineering labor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A yeah. <laughs> but it's a really important problem, and it, and 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 they tried lots of different clever s schemes to do that. None of them worked. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but an anyway. Uh, but that was, uh, despite the fact that that didn't work, we're still working on it, yeah. and we're still doing some research on that. Um, Do you have to pump it away, or are there other ways to separate it? I don't know, lasers, or like, what other ways can you separate to... Yeah, pretty much a pump, yeah. Pump? Pump, yeah. Okay, so we're still at the pump. So we're kind of at the pump. Um, we're actually, yeah, I can't really talk about the details. We're, 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 we're thinking about some new, new ideas in this in this arena, which are which is a big deal. Or membranes, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. helium's a different size than hydrogen, I don't know. Yeah. Again, it's just helium because sounds like a fun problem. It is. It is. It is a fun <laughs> problem, and it's, it's actually it's, it's a good segue. And, and as I said, it, to introduce both the, the, this class that I've taught, but also like what is fusion in the end? Like why why do I like why do I like working in fusion? Yeah, it's because it is. Although the core discipline of it is the so-called plasma physics, because you have to understand plasmas, you know, to to basically make this container work. The reality, a, a real fusion system is just so complex. Mm. You're building these magnets that are right at the ver, you know, right at the at, at the edge of, of, of magnet performance. You're, you're you're designing these pumps. You know, you're you're building physical structures that are uh, really challenging because you know you're putting these things you know besides looking something that's looking at a star, like literally some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, things that we design have to take almost the equivalent of like putting something on the surface of the sun in terms of heat loads. Um, so it is a it's it is the ultimate multidisciplinary uh, you know re research area. Like I said, if you're if you're bored, you're not paying attention you know, to, <laughs> to what's going yeah. on. Um, and that's actually why uh, that was one of the reasons I I taught this class uh, was because. Um, I really wanted to, most of the students were focusing on a plasma topic or something, which was totally fine, but I really wanted to get, you know, them and, and myself to get exposure sort of to, you know, what were, um, what kind of technology innovations could actually make fusion better. And one of them was this pump. Um, and then the next time I taught the class, along comes High temperature superconductors. Okay, let's talk about magnets. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah. talk about magnets because that's one of the things that's really changed what's been possible oh. in this space. Yeah. Okay, first, before we get too deep into it, yeah. actually describe how do you create a magnetic field to begin with. Yeah, it's actually real, really simple. I mean, uh, most people are familiar with this back in, uh, in grade school. You take uh, a battery, mm -hmm. you take a wire, mm -hmm. just a regular wire, you wrap it around a nail. Yeah. Remember this, and then yeah. you connect up the battery, and then and then you get little iron, you know, filings, and then you you turn on, and then oh look, I can pick up the filings with the so that is an electromagnetic coil. So uh, electricity current when you pump current through a spirally configuration, yep. you just get you get a magnet. You, you get a magnet. So yeah, so it's because electricity, electric current, and mag and making magnetic fields are fundamentally linked. Yeah. That's why it's called electromagnetism, electromagnetism or yeah. EM. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. So this this is the one of, you know this is the first thing that you basically you know it's called Maxwell's equations. It's right. essentially the the link between electric and magnetic fields. Um, and so in the end, like the the way that we and that's how we make magnet magnetic coils is that you basically take something uh, approximately like a circle and it's got an electric current going in a loop around this. Um, and the strength of the magnetic field is basically determined by the, ge the, the, the geometry of that and how much current that you're putting through it. Now, and if the current goes down to zero, it turns off the magnetic field zero. Now, I remember um, when you try to pump too much current through something, yeah. it can get hot, it yeah. can melt, yeah. Yeah. and that's why you got to make it thicker. You know, like yeah. when you install, um, okay, when you install like a like a light switch in in your house. Uh, if you if you connect too many light bulbs to it and yeah. the light switch itself the is not the appropriately sized, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Or you burn out the light yep. switch itself the, because yeah. it's, because it's not thick enough. Yep. So does this play into what you can do with yes. magnets and yes. with the yeah. constraints and yep. system? Yep. So th then this turns out like like what kind of magnetic field, like how big of a magnetic field do you need? So it turns out you know it, it turns out um, 
as big as you can get, <laughs> yeah. boss. Because the bigger, you create those atmospheres, extra atmospheres. The, the bigger, the bigger the magnetic field, <laughs> then the better the container of the bottle is. And also, the key thing that really drives it is the bigger the magnetic field is, then that exerts a bigger force on the particles which are inside. You know how hot it has to be. It has to be at a hundred million degrees. That's more or less almost a, a constant in these designs. So, um, that um, and here's the key. A feature of this is that uh, the electric the the current goes or the current is sorry the magnetic field is made by the current going in the loop, but when you put a charged particle in a magnetic field, it itself goes in a loop, mm. something called a gyro radius. And so it just it loops around the magnetic field like this. The size of that loop of how what it's spinning around is set by t you know for hydrogen fuel, which is what we're using, set by only two things. It's temperature and the strength of the magnetic field. But the temperature is fixed, more, more or less. So, um, and if you increase the magnetic field, then that decreases the size of the, of the circle because it's basically exerting more force on it and it forces it to go in a smaller and smaller spiral. So if you double magnetic, every time you double the magnetic field, the size of that gyro radius goes down by a factor of two. So it is basically fitting a thousand of like those gyro radii in your plasma that is, is the containment. Uh, so every time you double magnetic field, you make that go down by a factor of two. And this means the linear size of the plasma can be shrunk by a factor of two and the volume goes down by a factor of eight because well, it goes like the- because R it's cubed. A, uh, R cubed. So that's at its heart, like why you want to keep increasing the magnetic. So what's the strength of the magnetic? The magnetic fields that we're going for are in excess of 100,000 times the Earth's magnetic field. These, this is not like a fridge magnet. This is major, major. And in, in fact, um, we, we basically push mag magnets up to, to, to the very limit. So, 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 so you said, so like, oh, there must be some limitation to this. There's absolutely limitation to this. <laughs> is that if you take a normal copper wire, yeah. um, that current in a normal wire is, is making heat. This, is, this yeah. is your toaster oven. Like when you look in there and you see, don't, don't stick your finger in there, but you know, when you look in and you see those little red hot things, yeah, yeah. that's electric current going through a wire uh, and it'll get hot, yeah. right? Um, so even your power lines, it, yeah, power lines, ever yeah. right? Or or think, you think of the fuse thing that you said for your house. Yeah, yes, all, all, all those things. So, uh, but the current makes the magnetic field. So at some point, you'll run into one of two limits. One of them is that the magnet will get too hot, or, or two, um, the other thing that's, that, that's happening is that as the magnetic field increases, remember that pressure that we want, by the way, yeah. to hold the plasma is actually exerting a pressure on the coil itself. So the coil wants to push apart by its own by its own pressures that it's producing. So at some point you'll reach a mechanical limit, like yeah. it just will not be able to. It'll push apart, and then the magnet will cease to function. Um, so you have to solve both those. That's actually what our line of. I mean, I can't go into all the details of it, but basically, the reason that we ha we hold that record for for plasma uh, pressure yeah. was because we use magnetic fields which are triple, quadruple. What other uh, because there was an that, innovation yeah. outside this lab in, mag in, yeah. in creating uh, what they call um, uh, what, high temperature magnets, which is not really high temperature. It's like yeah. it's not even room temperature. You're still yeah. like what eighty yeah, Kelvin yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah that's right. So it's sort of like a liquid nitrogen. Okay, yeah, so it's yeah. so very yeah. freaking cold. But yeah. It's cold yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's relative high temperature because most of those superconductors had to be near absolute zero, right? Um, <laughs> Wait, so who yeah. created these magnets? Is so this is uh, what's well, actually so. The, the, so it's actually not a magnet. So this is the conductor, namely. Yeah. So this is the this is the thing that's carrying the current. Yes. So in the end, to make magnetic fusion work, you cannot use actually copper. I mean, we use it in our experiments just because we can. And what happens? We basically can turn on the magnetic field for some short period of time study the plasma and how it's being contained. And not worried about the coil itself getting hurt. But, we, we, but then we basically have to turn off the coil because yeah, it's yeah. going to get too hot. And if, when you go through the numbers, it turns out the amount of electricity that's being consumed to turn on the magnetic field will always greatly exceed the amount of fusion power you're going to make. So okay. that's another reason. It's like, oh, then you can't use yeah. copper magnets. So you have to use something called a, and copper is a great conductor. Yeah. So what are you using? You're using something called a superconductor. 
The superconductor has the feature that it has no resistance. So pe most people are familiar with this or MRI devices, like that big thing that your your body is being put into. No um, resistance means you can pass current through it. Cost, that current is then not turned into heat. That's right. That's no resistance. That is the definition. It, of no it's resistance. it's not turned into heat, and once you put the the current into it, because it's not using heat, it'll actually just stay in there forever. So you're not consuming electricity either. Mm. Oh yeah. So in the end, for a fusion device, is that this is everything. I mean, for, for a power plant. Because you make the magnetic bottle with the superconductors, but you actually, all you have to do is keep it cold enough, um, and it's not consuming electricity. Okay, but the whole system is kind of creating heat. So you got something you got to keep cold, and something that's inherently creating heat. Remember uh, that neutron hits the coolant, yeah. creates some heat. So, you, so, so how do you deal with these two things? Uh, so what you do is you, 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 you nestle... You the plasma, in, you, 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 you physically insulate them from each other. Um, like but, but it's basically, off, yeah. but it's hot, yeah. it's plasma hot, so 100 million degrees. Then you basically have a blanket, which is kind of like, you know, just kind of hot, right? I mean, it's like, you know, 500 degrees Celsius or something like that. Uh, and then you put some insulator around this, and then you keep a superconducting magnet cold at around like, tens of degrees above absolute zero. Wait, is the superconducting... <laughs> so it's pretty cool. 100 okay. million, you know, if we, we, if we go in Kelvin, it's like, you know, 100 million, 1,000, 10 in a space which is about like this big. <laughs> and the 1,000 yeah. Kelvin, that's the coolant, that's mm -hmm. the salt. The 100 million, that's the plasma. Yeah. And then the 10 is the yeah. superconducting magnet. Yeah. Oh, the superconducting magnet is all the way in the outside. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, so that's actually, so that's... And that's and that's so the neutrons don't hit it because they get stopped by that blanket in the middle first. Exactly. And so you don't have the uh, neutron damage to exactly. your system. Exactly. That's awesome. Yes, that's awesome. Right, exactly. And so, and particularly when it's a liquid, then that's your heat source sitting inside of this really cold thing. And you're not consuming electricity by making the magnets for it. So it's, it's kind of like... Uh, These magnets have to be new, though. This is a new thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is so the why now question, This right? is the why now question. Why yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, so what's, what, what happens? So... Um, so this is the class, and you know, it, you know, it was. Uh, well, you asked about like my personal story. I almost quit fusion. What? Yeah, I I was actually at a point where, I mean, part of it was like what had happened to our experiment, uh, but the other part problem was I was sitting there. I like being a scientist. I love being a scientist. I love being an educator. But I was really having a hard time figuring out like how we were actually going to get there, how yeah. we were actually going to make fusion power. Um, and uh, a lot of it was around the fact that I had worked most of my professional career. In fact, like the first talk I saw when I went to a fusion conference was, was about a project called EATER, which was so exciting. I mean, it just, it yeah. thrilled me about what it was doing. Bernard Bigot, another Bernard Titan. Bernard Bigot, yeah. exactly, another Titan. Um, uh, and I'd worked most of my professional career around that, and but I was getting more and more, you know, despondent about the time that it was taking. Yeah. Um, and I know that you talked to Bernard, and you know he's done a fantastic job of getting many, a, 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 that project more back on track. But you know, another part of it was, you know, I, I looked at Eater and it's just like, man, you know, there's that, and then we've got a whole bunch of other stuff to do to actually make power. Uh, after that, because Eater right. will be a e demonstration. Eater's about the science, not about, Eater's about the, the science. Uh, yeah, power engineering and, it's, and, and an amazing science project. But I was just like, will this really get there? I, I saw it. I saw it in my students as well too. It's like they're, you know, what am I going to work on? You know, yeah. when they were coming in. So this class, you know, it saved my career actually in fusion. It was pretty wild because um, <laughs> I, I came into that class and it was just like. So one of them, it was around this new technology. It was basically, I picked this, this new, so, so why was this all taking so long? What was happening? So it turns out in superconductors can only, for every kind of superconductor, you can only tolerate some kind of maximum magnetic field. Hmm. And an eater was exactly the right thing to design for the magnetic superconductors that were available in the mid 1990s. In fact, they had to develop these new Superconductors, a lot of it here at MIT in the Magnet Lab. Mm -hmm. There's some irony going on in there, um, but basically this then required that you had to build something at the scale of Eater, and yeah. everyone agrees Giant. that that's it's really big and it's it's a challenge to put it together. It's like taking like 
you know, what is it, seven international partners. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know if you saw the site, but it's a very impressive, very large site um, that came about that. So what happened was that um, the superconducting technology changed uh, in the interim. And really, you know, in my judgment, and this was about five or six years ago, um, and in fact, Bob Mumgard, who's now the CEO of the company you're going to talk to, yeah, he's so going to talk to you in one of the next, in one of the next podcasts, well. yeah. was one of the students in that. And I said, you know, so this was, it was a little bit more speculative, but I, you know, I looked at this and just said, wow, this is like really different, the superconductor. Let's see, you know, let's see what it gives us. And then three, you know, three of those versions of those classes later, you know, we basically were sitting there what what looked like a commercial prototype using the science that Eater uses. Yeah. It's actually a little bit more conservative actually than the science that Eater is using. Yet it had all these other features. It was it was uh, almost ten times smaller in size than Eater wow. because of its ability to access high magnetic field. And then there was a whole set of other engineering uh, choices that basically were allowed by the fact that you had this really you know, disruptive new kind of technology. Like one of the examples is that, you know, we figured out, the, the students figured out, you could actually build an electromagnet out of a superconductor, but then it could be taken apart. Mm. And so because by, by the fact that you could take it apart meant that that really allowed for a much more modularized and, 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 and I consider realistic way of like re replacing the interior components because in the end, you know, you still have to replace some of these sensitive interior components, you know, one, once in a while. I see. So, 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 this so it was is a beyond whole, just uh, even uh, creating uh, um, the key requirement, which yeah. is to get more power out of the system yeah. than you put in. But it also thinks to actually power plant operations long term as well. Yeah. So, so here and here, here was the thing. I mean, I guess I said the class really changed my mind about where we were because I re we realized collectively like what this new technology could. And, and the superconductor was good. And it wasn't that we didn't have work to do, but it was just like, wow, this opens up a kind yeah. of parameter space. And the biggest moment, which was interesting, was uh, it, it was the, the design class was not around that. In fact, in many ways, it was interesting. It was because I was so familiar with Eater's mission. It was really, well, could we do Eater's mission, but like in a more compact device? Yeah. That became ARC, uh, was the name of the device. Uh, affordable, robust, compact. Um, uh, of course, if you're fans of Iron Man, you might also recognize it. <laughs> it's actually an acronym. Um, um, but uh, it was so much smaller. And it, also, it was also, it became, you know, fairly readily a net power producer. So then I looked and it's just like, well, how much is this actually going to cost? And then when I saw that the cost per watt of this was basically the same, as the first fission power plants wow. in the 1950s. That was the, for me, that was the, the <laughs> bells are ringing right, moment. Because like- The reality moment. The yeah, well, it, and, and, and it's, uh, you know, and again, so, and it was, and it, it was not like, it was not a new, skim, like it was a tokamak, had the physics of eater, all of this great science that we'd actually established in many ways because we were, we were, we were building eater. But here was this new pathway. Um, and that new pathway wasn't just about accessing the science in a smaller scale. It was, it looked like a path towards, you know, a possibility of commercialization that was just vastly different than it, than it was. And then all of a sudden that turned around my ideas about, about fusion. So, um, so here we are. <laughs> and so now that's in fact uh, become the centerpiece uh, of where the MIT program uh, is going. Oh man, I feel like we're gonna have to do a part two at some point because there's so much more about the physics I want to learn and about magnetism and about the superconductor itself and some of this I guess I'll chat with Bob about. But since we only have so much time here, one note that I'd like uh, you to leave our audience on is just why you think this is important. I know you know that fission is cool, but yeah. why is it important? Yeah, so right. Um, so I work in fusion because when when you, when you look at its promise about what it could mean, we make fusion uh, economically viable. You know, it actually changes the world. Literally changes the world. And in fact, it changes human humanity. Um, is that it, it, it? It's not easy. <laughs> like I said, it's, it's. I mean, that's part of it. But what excites me about working on it because because it, it is hard. 
But if you consider a, f a power source that's carbon-free, intrinsically safe, it's intrinsically safe. You, you, you don't really have to design uh, the safety because, because anything goes wrong, it, the fusion just stops, right? Uh, that everyone can get access to the fuel, right? Um, and then just about the, its minimal, minimal environmental you know, footprint. Um, and in the end, you know, uh, my own vice president here for research at MIT says it right. It's like, when you crack fusion, you're d done, right? So that's, that's why we, we go after it. Um, and now the way that we're going after it is just... Um, is extremely exciting, you know, because with this new allowed by the technology, but now what we're seeing is an entire new generation of people coming into fusion um, that are doing way more than just plasma physics, because that's almost what everyone was just doing before, because it was a, it was a lofty goal to go towards, but we were just going to keep working on science for the next century, and maybe we would make fusion, you know, work. And all of a sudden, it's within our grasp. Yeah, that's why. Thank you so much. Thank you.